millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Yes, I estimate that if I had stayed in my job, in a corporate job with a lovely match from my company and invested into a 401k based on an increasing salary that I would have, yeah, between 1.3 and maybe even almost 2 million. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. Hey, it's Shauna here with some really exciting news. You can now listen to our entire back catalog completely ad free, exclusively on Stitcher Premium. Check out all your favorite episodes of Millennial Money, like How to Finally Master the Art of Budgeting. In addition to the Millennial Money Archive, you can also listen to every new episode ad-free, as well as tons of other ad-free Wondery shows with hundreds of hours of original content, audio documentaries, and exclusive bonus episodes from some of your favorite podcasts. You can sign up now for a free month of Stitcher Premium by going to stitcherpremium.com slash Wondery and using the promo code Wondery. Then once you're signed up, you just download the Stitcher app for iOS or Android and start listening. That's stitcherpremium.com slash Wondery in promo code Wondery. The idea of going solo is so super sexy. Sipping champagne all day long, vacationing when you want, working from anywhere in the world, But what happens to your cash when you go solo is an important piece of the puzzle, too. And our podcast guest today, Maura, is a superstar. But before I describe her amazing background, she decided one day just to sit down and factor out how much money she left behind the day she walked away from the corporate world. And yes, you heard her right, somewhere around $1.3 million. That's a lot of cash. But before we get to the juicy details, let me tell you a bit more about Maura. She's author of Hiding in the Bathroom, A Roadmap to Getting Out There When You'd Rather Stay Home. I can definitely relate to that. (laughs) And co-founder of award-winning social impact agency, Women Online. She's an internet marketer who's been working with Women Online since 1999 when she helped Hillary Clinton log on for her first internet chat. Maura has launched online campaigns for President Obama, Malala, the United Nations Foundation, Hillary Clinton for president, and many other leading figures and organizations. So yeah, you could say she's done some stuff. (laughs) So I had to know how she walked away from that kind of cash, and she was able to stomach it. Maura, I am so excited to have you join us on the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. I'm really happy to be here. So I wanted to start out with a little bit of a of a bang question. And let me get this right. You say that you lost somewhere around $1.3 million the day you left corporate America. That's a lot of cash. So tell me, how did this happen? <laughs> well, and I want to say, because it, it's sort of what I was, I wrote, this is based on an article that I wrote about um, the 401k gap, which is, we can talk about that um, more. 
but I was trying to figure out how much money I lost in my matching 401k over, let's see, let me do the quick math. <laughs> it's going to be 12, 12 years. Yes, 12 years. Um, and so I tried to like average out market returns, take 2008 into account. So <laughs> it's kind of a made up number. But yes, I estimate that if I had stayed in my job, in a corporate job with a lovely match from my company and invested into a 401k based on an increasing salary that I would have, yeah, between 1.3 and maybe even almost 2 million. That's a lot of cash. No kidding. And I, I read this article. You wrote this article for Girl Boss, and I also want to chat. There was something interesting that you that you said in there that most people, women in particular, don't make career decisions with future wealth in mind. We just we kind of make these these decisions. We don't think about these things. Like, why do you think women aren't? thinking about these things or or what should women be thinking about when they're making the decision between the corporate job and and starting their own thing like what are these things they should be thinking about well you know it's funny i don't think it's that we don't take future wealth into account i think that we have a kind of future wealth that is like a fantasy future wealth like if our business really takes off right yes what what i call entrepreneurship porn so i think that most people who leave uh, you know, steady job with benefits for their own thing, absolutely have a dream of future wealth in mind. It's just that it's this sexy exit version, right, of future wealth, not the more boring, but far Practical. more likely, right, future wealth of, hey, if I invest, you know, 18% of my salary and my company matches, you know, half of it or three quarters of it or 100% or whatever, over the next 25 years of my life, I'm going to have a lot of money. That's what we don't think about. And that's what women are not educated about. But I also think in general, most wannabe entrepreneurs are not educated about. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that everything you just said, the idea, the fantasy, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur my whole career except a really tiny stint. And I mean, this is going back to when I was in college. And it, it's tough. And I tell anybody before they make that that leap that there's a lot of things that you have to think about besides all the glorious things like having unlimited vacation time and unlimited earning potential, all of those <laughs> amazing things. But if you neglect certain things for a period of time, say investing or growing your wealth or even just covering risks, that's a danger zone that I think is the message is definitely not out there. It's so not out there, you know, and it's not even about being an entrepreneur. Anyone out there who's listening who's thinking about freelancing, right? Or consulting. Yes. I talk to people all the time who are like, gosh, you know, if I leave my job and I pick up freelance work, I'm going to make so much more money than I make in my job, right? Because when you think about hourly rates as a freelancer, it can be pretty it can be pretty darn sexy, right? And and actually the data is there that a lot of people who freelance do make more. But again, what you're not taking into account is all those benefits from healthcare to, you know, putting money into disability, et cetera, retirement. And let's face it, people, you've got to save money for your taxes, right? So yes. you've instantly got to take a bunch of that money off the top. And we, we just don't think that way. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the tax thing is a brutal reality. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So tell me some more about what you what you uncovered or what you talked about in this article. Uh, did you did you realize anything about, you know, stepping away from the corporate America that you wrote in this article that was sort of eye opening for you? Well, you know, it all started, I was reading the Washington Post and there was an article about um, the record number of 401k millionaires. It was from Fidelity Investments, you know, which is sure. one of the biggest managers in the world probably, does a study. And they reported that, you know, there were more 401k millionaires than ever before. And this was, you know, this was about eight, eight, ten months ago before the market got bumpy. Um, and I, I kind of sat there and I thought, Oh my God. Wow. 
And then I wanted to do some math because right. the truth is, is that 2016 was the first year that I had funded my SEP pension, right? So the, you know, freelancer self-employed version of a 401k since I had left corporate America in 2006. So what basically I sat there thinking after I read this article was, oh my God, I've missed the boat. Like yeah. <laughs> I, I could have been one of these people and I just wasn't because I was too busy trying to make a living, trying to build my business, et cetera, et cetera. Did I make the wrong choice? Am I going to be 90 years old and dependent on the kindness of strangers or my children because I neglected this or because I left? And I swear, I had never thought that way before. Yeah, it's definitely a eye-opening moment. <laughs> I think a lot of people could get <laughs> paralyzed with fear thinking about those sorts of things. Uh, but I think it's a it's an interesting experiment to have, even just to have that awareness. You know, I talk about that on this podcast a lot because most of us get stuck in fear around money. We don't want to know the numbers. We don't want to know any of that information. But knowing that information, I would imagine, even though that was alarming to you, that was also an empowering moment. I'll tell you what. And here's the good news. Don't get stuck in fear. I mean, look, it's basic. It's it's sort of like the nudge theory, right, of behavioral psychology. Um, and, and, and here's a little nugget, which is that um, according to AARP, people who have access to one of those easy check the box when you're doing your HR forms, employee sponsored retirement plan are 15 times more likely to save for retirement than those of us who don't have benefits. And this is not just people, you know, like us who are self-employed. This could be, you know, for the many, many people who don't have access through their employers to a retirement plan. And most people in America who work for small businesses do not. And that's a whole other show we could talk about. <laughs> so yes, you know, when you just get your HR forms and you check a box, you are more likely to save for retirement. But if you're listening to this and you're feeling anxious, let me tell you that this was two years ago. I have made up a lot of ground since then because I got my butt in gear and I got motivated. I got my SEP all um, squared away. I actually, I invest with Vanguard and um, they have so many free tools and advising tools that you can take advantage of to plan. And I started aggressively saving for my future. And I have to tell you that as sad as I am to have missed those 10 years of like great market, I do feel like in the two years since I had, you know, since I was able to start saving and even in the eight months or so since I had my road to Damascus moment reading the Washington <laughs> Post, like I've made up a lot of ground and I know where I am. So there are so many ways out there if you're self-employed to get started and you can make up ground quickly, but you have to face it. Yeah, that's such great advice. And I'm curious because obviously the the topic around women and money, women in general, frankly, uh, the pay gap, I mean, you name it, we're, we're in the news and, and we should be and there's conversations around it and hopefully that's leading to some sort of change. I mean, if we talk about retirement savings in general, if we look at people that are saving for retirement, the numbers are are not good. <laughs> they're they're abysmal well, across, yeah. the, across the board. Uh, but I'm really interested in, you know, what do you think it is about women when it comes to saving for retirement or saving for the future where there is this disconnect for a lot of women? I think there's three main factors. The first, I think, is cultural. And again, this is a generalization. And if you were raised in a family where your parents sat you down and had you saving from an early age, then, oh my gosh, am I jealous of you? <laughs> but um, I think that a lot of women, we're not acculturated to think about our personal finance, right? And it often hits us too late. We are geared to be really good consumers and shoppers and not really good nest featherers or savers. I mean, let's face it, right? We grow up reading fashion magazines and thinking or looking on Instagram about stuff we want to buy, not necessarily what stocks we want or mutual funds we want to invest yes. in. Right? So, so I think that's number one. Number two is that women, as we hit our late 20s and into our 30s, women are 65% of family caregivers. We are so much more likely than men 
to reduce our work hours, right. 43% of highly qualified women, professional women, will leave full-time, full-time employment, right? And so when you look at these numbers, it means that we're much more likely to, to disrupt our careers. Women are actually 53% of freelancers. So a lot of what happens is a woman will scale back, she'll disrupt her hours, she'll move to part-time, she'll lose her benefits, and she'll lose she'll lose ground in those peak earning years. And that's just unfortunate. So m- women need to stop bearing the caregiving brunt, right? And yeah. if we do take freelance or flexible jobs, we need to, again, have these conversations and see if we can fill the gap. And then the third thing is that we live longer than men. Right? <laughs> There's that um, reality. Yeah, we are, you know, going to live, I think it's 5% longer, which doesn't sound like a lot. But, you know, when you are living on a fixed income on your own, I think that probably, you know, touch wood, that feels like a lot. And so we have to plan, we just have to plan differently. And so I think it's really time for us as really smart women professionals, and I, and I love I love what Sally Krawcheck at Elevest has to say about this. You know, part of it is we need to start having smart conversations and looking our money in the face, and then part of it is we need to challenge a system that yes. was set up by men, frankly, <laughs> for men. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I I agree with that. You know, there's there's a lot of debate. Uh, I get a lot of pushback when I talk about women and money. Um, Usually from a male side and there's, I mean, you know, rightfully so someone can object, you know, saying like, well, why are you, you have access to all the same tools that we do as men. Yes, absolutely we do. But there is something I just feel innately programmed into almost every single woman that looks at something like money very differently. We're not supposed to aspire to have money as women, I I believe. Society tells us that's not something we're supposed to do. So if we come out of the womb with those sort of preconceived notions built in, whether that's spoken to us or not, that definitely is going to have an impact on how aggressive we are with negotiating our salary or valuing our our services or investing or whatever it may be. Oh my God, a hundred percent. And you know, the thing is, I think that men are raised to be financial caregivers and women are raised to be relational caregivers, right? So in a patriarchal society, men are raised to take care of people with money via money and women are raised to take care of people via our time and our effort, right? And so that has huge effects when it comes to planning for your financial future. You know, and so one thing that I would say to women is, you know, I'm I'm not a shark negotiator. Like I'm not one of these, you know, zero sum games, let's play a game of chicken <laughs> negotiators, you know. But my life changed when I heard this one piece of data, and I'm going to share it with the audience, and, and maybe someone else has shared it, but it's life-changing if, like me, you're a little bit nervous about negotiating. This is from Hannah Riley Bowles at Harvard, and she's a global expert on women and negotiation. When women approach a negotiation and talk about or invoke a benefit to someone else when they're asking for money, they get more money right? They get 15% more money. So if you are a woman and you are in a negotiation and you say, you know, I would really love X percent more salary because it will allow me to provide for my X, Y, and Z, or, you know, for me, I'm a business owner. So I would approach a negotiation and say, you know, I need to charge X amount because my team needs this and I want to pay for this really great service. And I make it not about me and my personal wealth, but about the team and taking care of other people. Both men and women respond to that. And so it's about changing the framing. And and you could even think about this in terms of your retirement. If you're scared of money, you've got to take care of yourself. But what would it feel like to take care of your family? And if yes. you have kids, that's an amazing feeling. Like if you put your mind and you say, gosh, what if I were a breadwinner and I could take care of people financially? It's really empowering. 
Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. We'll hear more from Mora after an Ask Shauna from Jules. And Jules says, hey, Shauna, thanks for taking time to check out my question. I'm turning 35 this year, and I've decided that it's finally time to deal with some of the not-so-fun stuff around money. I know you've talked about setting up a will online on your podcast, and I am super intrigued. Getting a free will almost seems too good to be true. What companies would you suggest, and what do you think I should think about? And... FYI, I'm just super proud of myself for sending in this message. It makes me feel so much like an adult. Thanks for answering, and thanks for having a podcast where I can learn something new each week. You rock. Well, Jules, my friend, I'm so happy for you. Owning your SHIT is really an important first step. In fact, it's an important step no matter where you are in the journey of life. But I know a will is not one of those sexy topics, like you said, but it's an important one because we all have stuff. And why wouldn't you want your stuff to go to who you want it to go if something happens to you? And I know you're not here, so technically what doesn't matter to you, but in just my little pea brain, you've spent years buying stuff, working hard for your money, so why not give that stuff to who you want it to go to? That's just my two cents. But okay, two companies I can talk about that I've talked about on other podcast episodes are Willing and Tomorrow. Tomorrow is actually an app. Both are great companies, great services. Tomorrow is actually free. You can set up a free will. And Willing.com does cost 69 bucks when you want to print and sign your will. So There's obviously a difference between the two of those, but I think they're both great options, especially for somebody young, somebody starting out, even somebody I would say 40 and under who wants to get something in place, at least now, just to CYA. I also think, though, it's a good idea to have an attorney, if you can, glance over your document, at least at some point in time, just to make sure you've got all your bases covered. And please, whatever, remember to update your will as you get more stuff or life changes. And I think that's another important thing about 
things like wills and trusts is we tend to set those things up and then we forget about them. But as you go through life, obviously you're going to get more assets, you're going to get more stuff, uh, you're going to buy houses and all sorts of things. That's hopefully my goal for you. Whatever that version of life you want to, uh, to look like, I hope you get that that stuff. But all that stuff needs a place and it needs to be protected and Again, it's just really important that that stuff goes to whoever you want it to go. So I congratulate you, Jules, for wanting to take this on. I know this is not a fun topic. When we did our will, it was like, oh, God, I mean... I know how important this stuff is, but it still managed to find its way to the bottom of the to-do list all the time until I just finally said, you know what, we just have to do this. And I think what's cool about services like Willing.com and Tomorrow is that it makes creating wills and things like this really accessible, especially if you're like, I don't have a lot of cash, but you know how important these things are for your financial future and for protecting any risks you might have. I just think it's like technology has just done the most amazing thing to finances and it's allowing a lot of us access to you financial documents and, and creation of things to to help our financial plan that we just didn't have or that were super expensive before. I mean, the idea of paying attorney $2,000 to set up a will and trust is probably not something that is definitely going to be on the top of your list. But if you can get something in place for a small amount of money under 100 bucks, why wouldn't you? You can't literally go wrong. So thanks, Jules, for sending in the question. And I applaud you for going out there and doing something that isn't super sexy, but is super important to your financial foundation. Yeah. Wow. There's so much to unpack there. That That is amazing. And it's <laughs> You know, it's, it's, I talk openly on this podcast about my own life and my stories. And in my, right after I turned 30, I got divorced. It was a terrible divorce. And as most divorces are, but, um, it left me basically in a negative sum balance having to start over. And I said, I will not go through life not being able to, fund myself. Like that was just something going forward that was so critically important to me to know that I could take care of myself no matter what. So when I got remarried again and the my business started to pick up with the podcast and all the other media things I do, my husband, who's a, a travel writer and journalist, said, hey, how about I come and, and join you as the producer and kind of behind the scenes and help the ship go and the ship get bigger? But that was a tough moment because then that meant that the ownership of making money was on my shoulders primarily. <sighs> and also yeah. he had to be okay with that relationship. And those were tricky conversations that didn't get solved overnight and took a few therapy sessions <laughs> because <laughs> I think as in society, we're the, the, the opposite dynamic is what is set up to be the equation of success, particularly in a relationship. But there's no reason that it couldn't be something different. And there's no reason that a woman couldn't uh, like you say, you know, basically own what she's worth and provide for her family in, in a specific way. I mean, and, and I tell people all the time, look, if you're getting married, you're going to go through so many switches of you make more, he makes more, but, you know, I mean, there's just so much that happens in life to get rooted and stuck in one, um, particular, you know, roles in that relationship. So, but that, that was definitely some interesting conversations around that. Did you, can I ask you a question? So when you sat down with your, with your husband, did you ever have a conversation about what you wanted your old age together or your retirement to look like? You know, we always see these commercials, right? And it's this couple and they're meeting with their investment advisor in some like leather paneled, lovely room. And it's like, <laughs> oh, we want to volunteer and we want to do, did you, I mean, you're a money expert. Do you have those conversations? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think we had those conversations <laughs> probably like first or second date, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> uh, just because, you know, for me, it's important, especially the second time around that I was doing this, that we really had a, a mutual vision. And I said to my husband before we got married that, look, I want to find somebody that 
if I had to live, God forbid, in a in a box on a street, that I would be happy with that we would still have mutual goals and that we would still work together as partners. So for us, it's very much about and every year we do this, we sit down and create like a vision, like what what's changed? How are we going to get where we want to go? And I think it's just really important to have those conversations, even maybe if you don't totally agree. Totally. Uh, right. And if you don't agree, you better know that, right? Oh, I yes. Because <laughs> I think, I mean, I, it's so funny because I forget some famous therapist said couples all, always have the same fight, right? And yes. so- if you're a couple and money is your is one of your big issues, then thinking about your future, I think, is so important. I mean, it's so funny because, I mean, I – every day, I love my work, but I'm like, oh, man, I want to be retired. I, I have this vision <laughs> of what my life is going to be like, and I want to hike in the Himalayas and do all this stuff. And, and, and sometimes I have to invoke that when I want to spend something or when my husband and I are, get a little excited about something we want to do that would spend money in the now. Yes. I literally have to try to like envision myself as a fit, healthy, 80-year-old, you know, hiking. Yes. And that, I mean, what you just said is so valuable. And I talk about that a lot. And I really hope that that sinks in because so many people hate the idea of of looking at where their money is going or God forbid the the be the budget word. But if you can root it in, why am I doing this? Well, I'm doing this because I want to go hike in the Himalayas. I want to go do these things. It can give you the motivation to go, you know what? I'm going to make a different decision this time, or I'm going to put what I was going to spend on X into my Himalaya savings account or whatever it might be <laughs> for you. And that you're not going to do this perfectly. And we're all human and we're all going to spend too much on something just because that's what we do. It's no fun if you don't have those moments. But I think if you can really root in the goal and the, and the vision, it makes it a lot easier for you to say, I'm going to look at my numbers or I'm going to not be scared to invest or whatever it might be. And, and put it on auto. I mean, this is, again, it's a cliche, but like have that money on automatic into those accounts. Yes. So you don't even have to think about it. <laughs> Well, I'd love to ask you just a little bit. I mean, you've had such a unique and amazing career, and I'd love if you're willing just to share a little bit about your own career and, and money journey and, and a little bit about what you do, like why you're so passionate about women. Absolutely. As we know, I left full-time corporate employee in 2006 because I hated going to work. I had so many jobs from the time that I graduated college um, to when I, I finally left in 2006. I was 30. I was very lucky in that I was born during a time when it was sort of the original dot-com boom, and I went into the internet field, and so I was able to get great jobs in internet marketing, and um, I was really good at getting jobs. I was really bad at keeping jobs, <laughs> mostly because I don't like to go to work. I don't like to be in an office with lots of other people. I don't like meetings and office culture and the constant pressure of being on and socializing all day. I'm a little bit of a hermit. I'm an extreme introvert. I wrote a book called Hiding in the Bathroom because that's what I do a lot. And so what I realized about myself is I am a total overachiever workaholic. I love to work, but I love to work alone and on my own terms in terms of controlling my time and my schedule as much as I possibly can. And so I fell into freelancing and I'm a huge fan of freelancing. If you have a skill set that you've developed while working for someone else and it's not working for you, I recommend trying to freelance for a little bit if you feel like it's something you can do financially because if you're like me, you may find that you like the work that you do. In my case, I do digital marketing and online communications, but you don't like how 
sort of the world makes you do it. A lot of people aren't cut out to go sit in an office cubicle for 10 hours a day, you know, yeah. and frankly, why would we be? So, so that was a real aha moment for me. So I, after freelancing for about three years, started my company, Women Online. I was a digital political consultant when I worked in corporate. I worked in Washington, D.C. I worked in New York and London first in online consumer marketing. So I worked in online travel. I worked at iVillage.com, the very first website that was geared towards women. So I was really, really good at getting eyeballs to websites, right? Like that's what I knew how to do. And I knew how to deliver messages online. And I was really early in this whole kind of blogging culture. I was a political blogger um, starting in 2004. So I was an early blogger and I knew the power of online community. So I took that skill set of understanding politics and message delivery and frankly, the internet and started my company, Women Online. And so what we do is we create communications and digital marketing campaigns that mobilize women. And we work mostly with nonprofits, political campaigns, foundations. We do a lot of work in the health space, um, reaching parents about how to, you know, make their kids healthier and employ behavior change techniques. And we've worked on four presidential campaigns And I'm really, really proud of what I've built, although I wish I had saved more for retirement along the way. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But um, but but I'm here to tell you also that, uh, you know, I've been watching the show Working Moms on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it. Yes. Okay, it's painful. If anyone out there, it's really raunchy and really funny, but it's a bunch of moms who have little babies and are really struggling with who am I and what do I do? And I'm 10 years in. And it's this show has really reminded me that it's such an up and down journey, but you can't don't give up, you know, like find your way and remember that you are skilled and talented. Like when I look back and I think about what I've managed to build with three kids and um, a parent who died of cancer and all the ups and downs of my husband's work and multiple moves and all the stuff. <laughs> um I feel really proud today. Um, So, yeah, that show has got me thinking a lot about the journey of the ambitious working mother. That's so amazing. And I'd love to hear just a little bit more about your book, Hiding in the Bathroom. I, by the way, love that title. Uh, There's so many times, (laughs) I feel like I resonate with you because there's so many times I'd rather hang out in the bathroom than have to go and be in the public. And I've talked about battles that I've had with the anxiety and depression and times where I just wanted to stare at the wall. But you you do. You have to sometimes you have to get out there as your as your book says. You have to get out there, put yourself out there, and you have to fight through some of these things, whether it's just a fear of this or it's it's something better. What are what are some of the topics you cover in this book? Well I, I am I'm big on anxiety. I think that um, anxiety is is coming out of the closet right now, and and people and especially successful leaders are more and more open to talking about it. Yes, which I think is a really good thing because you know what, thirty to forty percent of the population has anxiety. We all have it, and we don't just leave it at the door when we go to work. So you're right. When you have anxiety as a companion, when you have depression as a companion, or like me, you may be, you know, really introverted and it's just a lot for you to perform because our work culture is very performative, you know, when you think about meeting and collaborating and all the stuff that we <laughs> ask people to do every day, right, in many jobs, um, you need to work differently. And that's where hiding in the bathroom comes in. All I mean by hiding in the bathroom is understanding your needs, right? So that sometimes during a really stressful day, you might need to take five minutes to go like be alone in a bathroom, literally, yes. right? And 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 that's that's great. You know, I think that the ability to understand and tune in, I have a friend who's a, a psychologist and, and, and she says, you know, most people end up in her office in a really bad state because they're like, oh my God, what the F just happened? They don't know how to tune in to what they need. And so I think what it really comes down to and what I talk about in Hiding in the Bathroom and in all my work is understanding yourself and what you need to do your best work, right? So tuning in and then figuring out the strategies that you can employ 
to get there. Like it's not, it's not rocket science. It might right, be, yeah. I really need a morning a week to work from home. I mean, it's, it's those small tweaks that you can do to really like stay in for the long game. Oh, I love it. I mean, that just, I think that's something like everybody needs to hear those strategies and, and figure that out for their, for themselves. Like what are those things? And this has been such an amazing conversation. I feel like we could talk for so much longer, but I'd love to know what's maybe one gem you can leave us about uh, thinking about making smart money decisions when it comes to our career, our retirement, what are, what's that thing that we should be thinking about or that thing to motivate us to maybe take action? So this, this is what I find motivating. I am very big on understanding what I call your monthly nut. Okay. And it sounds a bit funny, but the nut is how much money do I need a month post tax? to make my life happen. Yes. And when you know that number, life is a lot less scary, or if it feels scary, you at least are empowered to take action. So one of the things, and again, this ties into anxiety. If you're an anxious person, you might avoid those numbers. I would challenge everyone today to go figure out their nut. Um, and a lot of us lie to ourselves. <laughs> we discount it. <laughs> that is the truth. <laughs> so once you actually literally know how much money you need, you can make much more clear-eyed decisions. Such great advice. Well, Maura, thanks so much for being here. And tell, oh, the thanks, listeners, tell the listeners where they can go to find you and grab a copy of your book. Well, hidinginthebathroom.com. And you can order the book. It's now out in paperback. Um, wherever you buy your books, you can um, listen to my my podcast. is called Hiding in the Bathroom. It's actually on hiatus. I'm actually about to announce a really exciting new podcast about anxiety and leadership, which I'm super excited about. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. It's Mora A M M O R R A A M. Hey, thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. It's absolutely free and you'll make sure you never miss an episode of Millennial Money. You can also listen to all our episodes on Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, and Pandora.